हेलो गाइस दिस इज डॉक्टर सोनाली हियर आई एम ब्रिंगिंग टू यू अ वेरी एसेंशियल टॉपिक ऑफ न्यू नेटोलॉजी दिस इज कमिंग फ्रॉम आवर चैनल द न्यू नेटो हब सो द टॉपिक दैट वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस टुडे इज जॉन्डिस इन अ बेबी दैट इज जॉन्डिस इन अ न्यू बॉर्न चाइल्ड नाउ द जॉन्डिस ऑल्सो नोन एज हाइपिलिरोबिनेमिया कैन बी ऑफ टू टाइप्स इट कैन बी आई डायरेक्ट और इनडायरेक्ट For the sake of this presentation, we are going to discuss the indirect hypovolemia, and uh, I'll be having one separate lecture presentation on direct jaundice as well. So let us proceed. Now, hypovolemia is defined as an excessive level of accumulated bilirubin in the blood, and it is characterized by jaundice. Jaundice is the clinical sign. It is a yellowish discoloration of the skin, sclera, mucous membranes, and nails. Now, before discussing the pathology, let us discuss the basic anatomy and physiology of the hepatobiliary system. Now, hepatobiliary system consists of liver. Then we have underlying the liver there is a gall bladder. We have uh, multiple bile ducts, which uh, drain bile into the common bile duct. here is the common bile duct then we have the cystic duct the bile finally form drains into the duodenum from the common bile duct now going further to the physiology of bilirubin metabolism now bilirubin is formed by the breakdown of rbc in rbc that is the first step we have the heme moiety and the globin moiety now the heme moiety it is broken down into bilirubin and the ferrous form of iron the bilirubin thus formed further combines with albumin and this is the way it is circulating into uh, the blood stream this is then further uptaken by the liver in the second step the liver takes up the bilirubin and further there is conjugation which occurs inside the liver now conjugation means that the glucuronic acid and the bilirubin is combined and we get conjugated bilirubin uh, we'll be discussing the various enzymes which are linked to the conjugation process further now the conjugation is a very important step because this is the step which uh, determines whether we have direct jaundice or indirect jaundice and accordingly the management differs a conjugated uh, bilirubin excess is termed as direct jaundice and excess of unconjugated bilirubin causing jaundice is known as indirect jaundice now after the step of conjugation has taken place the bile is then as we saw it goes into the duodenum now in duodenum the bile is broken down by the gut bacteria this is the part the gut bacteria they are responsible for degradation of bile to urobilinogen and stercobilinogen stercobilinogen is excreted via the feces whereas urobilinogen is excreted via the kidneys there is some amount of reabsorption of urobilinogen which occurs here this is a very important step as uh, there is a moiety known as enterohepatic circulation if there is stagnation that is if there is uh, um, bile which is remaining into the intestine for a longer time there will be greater uptake into the uh, blood stream and thus the child will have indirect jaundice Now coming over to what exactly do we mean by neonatal hypobilirubinemia? When the rate of bilirubin production exceeds the rate of elimination, the end result is hypobilirubinemia. Jaundice is the most common transitional finding in a newborn period. It occurs in about 60 to 70 percent of term babies and approximately 80 percent of preterm babies. Significant jaundice occurs in approximately 6 percent of the term babies. an elevation of serum bilirubin concentration more than 2 mg per deciliter is found in virtually all the newborns in the first few days of life but jaundice that is the clinical sign of hypobilirubinemia it becomes apparent when the total amount of serum bilirubin exceeds more than 5 mg per deciliter the physiologic uh, ranges of total serum bilirubin remains controversial as these levels are affected by several factors like the gestational age of the baby the birth weight of the baby the disease state even the level of hydration affects a lot nutritional status as we know that uh, enteral uh, enterohepatic circulation plays an important role in 
indirect uh, jaundice so earlier the child goes on complete enteral feeds there will be lesser chances of uh, jaundice also the level of albumin will uh, be very important because once the level of albumin decreases in the blood stream there will be more amount of uh, unconjugated uh, bilirubin which will be free and this will result in again indirect hyperbilirubinemia even the ethnic background has an important uh, uh, point to be taken into consideration when we discuss neonatal hyperbilirubin what we need to know is indirect is unconjugated so in un can be remembered and direct uh, jaundice is uh, due to conjugated bilirubin excess so now what are the causes of hyperbilirubinemia this we are talking about clinically uh, significant hyperbilirubinemia now increase in bilirubin level can be seen secondary to increased hepatic bilirubin load or decreased hepatic bilirubin clearance now increased hepatic bilirubin load will be seen with certain things as we know the preterm babies they are higher prone to development of uh, hyperbilirubinemia this will be because the newborn rbc physiology itself is uh, responsible this is in term as well as preterm but the preterms are more affected there is in there is increased rbc levels in a newborn along with that there is a short rbc life span so both of this together leads to early breakdown of rbcs and uh, as we know uh, the bilirubin comes from breakdown of rbc itself that is the hemoglobin part then enhanced enterohepatic circulation is responsible for increased bilirubin load any hemolytic disease where there is increased breakdown of rbcs as we can see in rbc membrane defects like spherocytosis or elliptocytosis enzyme defects like g6pd deficiency even pyruvate kinase deficiency for that sake hemoglobinopathy is like thalassemias generally presenting in such a early time will be alpha thalassemias or acquired hemolysis which can be secondary to rh incompatibility or abo incompatibilities and the other miscellaneous causes of increased hepatic bilirubin load are polycythemia then any uh, any of the cephal hematomas or hematomas or bruises in any part of the body where there is stagnation and there will be more breakdown of rbcs will be having increased hepatic bilirubin load or any sort of hemorrhages second coming on to the decreased hepatic clearance here we can see either it can be decreased hepatic uptake or it can be decreased hepatic conjugation the hepatic uptake is uh, decreased in patent ductus venosus and there is decreased hepatic conjugation there are certain syndromes uh, which are responsible for this like regular najar syndrome gilbert syndromes we'll be discussing that further so how do we classify neonatal jaundice neonatal jaundice can be physiologic jaundice or pathologic so physiologic jaundice is the one which appears after 24 hours of life the maximum intensity is by 4th to 5th day in a term baby and by a 7th day in the preterm baby the total bilirubin levels will be within normal centiles for age in us based on the normogram that is these are the bhutani charts clinically this jaundice is not detectable up detectable after 14 days and it should disappear without any treatment as against to that pathologic jaundice is the one which appears within the first 24 hours of life commonly we see as an rh incompatibilities abo incompatibilities most of the hemolytic diseases will present such early phase even our uh, spherocytosis for that sake increase of bilirubin beyond 5 mg per deciliter per day or at a rate of more than 0.2 mg per deciliter per hour then serum bilirubin levels which are more than 95th percentile for age in us based on the normogram jaundice which is persisting after 14 days in full term babies is considered to be pathologic and it requires further uh, tests to diagnose what is the cause of jaundice clay colored stool white colored stools or uh, high colored urine which is staining the clothes yellow again we have to look into it because this is a sign of direct bilirubin uh, excess 
and any form of direct hyperbilirubinemia is considered to be pathologic. That is, the direct bilirubin more than 2 mg per deciliter or more than 20% of the total serum bilirubin is considered to be direct hypobilirubinemia and it is always a pathologic jaundice. What are the causes of physiologic jaundice? As we have already discussed, there is increased bilirubin load due to physiologic increase in the RBCs as well as decreased RBC lifespan. So, there will be more of a breakdown of RBCs giving more load to uh, the liver for bilirubin. Secondly, there is decreased immediate postnatal bilirubin uptake due to reduced level of lig ligandin activity. Then the hepatic enzymes are immature for bilirubin conjugation. This takes around 10 to 15 days for the enzymes to mature. Then increased enterohepatic circulation because there, have, there can be a l uh, lack of intestinal flora and greater proportions of the beta glucuronidase. This is the enzyme which uh, breaks down the urobilinogen and stercobilinogen into bilirubin and thus there will be again more bilirubin uptake into the blood and will be uh, landing up in hyperbilirubinemia. Now this is uh, overall a slide showing the physiologic uh, neonatal jaundice pathogenesis. As we saw decreased RBC lifespan then uh, the enzyme activity is only 1% of the full enzyme activity present at birth. So there is a decreased liver's ability to conjugate bilirubin. So there will be a higher level of unconjugated bilirubin in the body. Again, the ligandin protein levels are less. So the ability of hepatocytes to bind and retain bilirubin within the cells will be less. So there will be greater diffusion into the blood and increased unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. As unconjugated bilirubin is less water soluble, so it is harder for excretion. The conjugated bilirubin on the other hand can be excreted via the uh, gut. So there is decrease of elimination of bilirubin from the body. Next uh, the patent ductus venosus. Here there is greater unconjugated bilirubin shunted directly into the inferior vena cava. Then decreased amount of intestinal bacteria at birth leads to decreased conversion of bilirubin to urobilin or stercobilin. So there will be increased unconjugated bilirubin left and this will be absorbed into the bloodstream. There are two other entities which we need to know which is very important in neonatal jaundice. First is the breast milk jaundice and the second is the breast feeding jaundice. For breast milk jaundice, there are high levels of beta glucuronidase in breast milk of some women. These beta glucuronidase deconjugates the bilirubin while in the baby's bowel. This leads to increased unconjugated bilirubin absorbed into the bloodstream. And there is increased enterohepatic circulation of bilirubin and we land up in having a clinical jaundice in the child. Now the important thing to know about breast milk jaundice is uh, the jaundice never goes beyond the physiologic ranges. Also, this jaundice generally will come down on its own. There is no need to stop breastfeeding for this baby. Breast milk will be continued and there will be reduction in the jaundice which will be seen after two to three days. So the management part is very essential because this is the type of jaundice which is a terminology of exclusion. The baby will be a well feeding baby, the jaundice will be persistent, only thing we need to rule out the other causes like say hypothyroidism in this child and we can continue breastfeeding for the child and counsel the parents accordingly that the jaundice will go away. The second important entity that we need to know is breastfeeding jaundice. Now this is very important because this is a result of ineffective breastfeeding. It can be a result of poor latching or cracked nipples, there can be uh, breast engorgement. Lactation failure in such a way, it results in insufficient breast milk intake. So there will be dehydration, plus there will be starvation, the gut motility will be slowed down. Because of this, there will be increased enterohepatic circulation and uh, that is why the child will land up in jaundice. So we need to know that breastfeeding jaundice is very essential to look into. And this is jaundice which we can say is pathologic as well. 
now the total resultant will be there is increased serum unconjugated bilirubin because of which we see jaundice in the child so just highlighting the important concepts which we need to know about the physiologic jaundice yeah go on as per the time of presentation there are certain differential diagnoses which we need to have at the back of our mind for any sort of pathologic jaundice now any jaundice presenting in first 24 hours of life as we have said is the definition of pathologic jaundice the causes can be hemolytic disease of newborn this can be secondary to rh or abo incompatibility the antenatal infections like uh, torch infections even malarial infection any other bacterial sepsis in the child g6pd deficiency especially if the uh, child is a male child then uh, you need to keep in mind about the g6pd deficiency as well when the jaundice is uh, first seen in 24 to 72 hours of life the differentials can be that it can be a physiologic jaundice it can be secondary to polycythemia it can be secondary to sepsis intraventricular hemorrhage can also present with jaundice and any increased enterohepatic circulation secondary to feeding issues or intestinal anomaly like hot spring disease can present with jaundice so here it is important that we see the child clinically and then determine what can be the cause again physiologic will be the commonest but we need to exclude uh the other uh, differential diagnosis if there is any other clinical sign in the child now beyond 20 uh, beyond 72 hours of life the jaundice can be secondary to sepsis the child can have cephalhematoma or for that matter any other hematoma or hemorrhage or bruises on any other part of the body it can be neonatal hepatitis it can be a uh, direct jaundice there can be biliary atresia which can be hepatic or extra hepatic breast milk jaundice as we have already seen can present and various metabolic disorders can present with uh, jaundice so again the clinical condition of the child has to be looked for these are the causes of pathologic jaundice first is excessive red cell hemolysis as we have seen various uh, hemoglobinopathies or the membrane defects or even our uh, autoimmune uh, Uh, disorders then defective conjugation of bilirubin it can be secondary to breast milk that is breast milk jaundice various metabolic endocrine disorders the one which we have to be most concerned about is hypothyroidism never ever forget that a jaundice in a newborn child can be related to hypothyroidism and um, most of the time jaundice can be the only presenting part so we need to keep our antennas high for hypothyroidism in fact it is better that we go for a universal screening itself then uh, it can be secondary to increase enterohepatic circulation and there can be other miscellaneous causes coming over to the management of jaundice there are three important wheels which we can see monitor diagnose and treatment and follow up so monitoring all new bonds should be routinely assessed for jaundice jaundice is visible when the serum bilirubin levels are more than 5 mg per deciliter new bonds have to be observed for a minimum of 72 hours for a jaundice appearance in case of discharge before 48 hours uh, which is commonly seen bilirubin risk factors and hyperbilirubinemia risk factors as per the normal plans should be assessed at discharge and follow up has to be advised accordingly the parents have to be counseled that the child may be normal right now but by 3 to 5 days of life even a normal child can have some degree of jaundice so there has to be a follow up a pre discharge total serum bilirubinemia uh, total serum bilirubin or a transcutaneous bilirubin reading has to be done if the discharge is done before 72 hours of life now there are certain risk factors Uh, depending on the risk factors and the level of bilirubin will be advising follow up the risk factor include jaundice so this is jaundice within the first 24 hours of life 
never discharge this child this is a type of pathologic jaundice we have to look out for the cause of jaundice and treat accordingly a sibling who was jaundiced as a unit again high antennas unrecognized hemolysis in a child needs further diagnostic uh, approach a non optimal sucking or nursing in the child this can be a primary cause of jaundice as we have seen uh, dehydration or the intrahepatic circulation uh, can be the cause or this can be a secondary sign to sepsis or even certain metabolic disorders deficiencies of enzymes like g6pd deficiency pyruvate kinase deficiency is a high risk any infection the early onset late onset sepsis is a high risk kefal hematoma or bruising and if the child has the ethnicity that is the child is east asian or north indian there is a high chance of jaundice so this child should not be discharged at any cost before 72 hours of life even after that the follow follow up uh, date has to be clearly marked So this is the normogram for designation of hyperbilirubinemia, risk based on the R specific bilirubin value. This is the Bhutani charts. Now, as we can see, we have the postnatal age in hours on the x-axis, and we have the serum bilirubin levels on the y-axis. Accordingly, there has been a plotting done, which uh, classifies low risk zone, intermediate low risk, high intermediate risk, and high risk zone. so this charting has to be done and uh, thus we can determine which baby lies in which risk zone because the follow up will be done accordingly so the aap that is american academy of pediatrics has given certain screening guidelines the child with gestational age of 35 to less than 38 weeks plus the hyperbilirubinemia risk factors which we have already seen jaundice uh, the risk factors always a pre discharge total uh, serum bilirubin or a transcutaneous bilirubin values have to be assessed accordingly the child will be classified into the bilirubin risk zones again as per the normogram so for a high risk child evaluate for phototherapy do total serum bilirubin in 4 to 8 hours for a high intermediate evaluate for phototherapy a total serum bilirubin or a transcutaneous bilirubin in 4 to 24 hours have to be done in a low intermediate group if the discharge is less than 72 hours then the child has to be followed up in 2 days plus a transcutaneous or serum bilirubin levels have to be done at the follow up and if the child comes in the low risk and the discharge is planned before 72 hours of life then the follow up in 2 days can be done there is no necessity of uh, any blood investigation at this point now if the gestational age is 35 to less than 38 weeks but there are no risk factors or if the child is greater than 38 weeks however there are risk factors then it comes under the type 2 we need to see a pre discharge total uh, serum bilirubin or transcutaneous bilirubin again the bilirubin will be plotted on the bhutani chart as per the normogram and the risk zones will be considered for a high risk zone the child has to be evaluated for phototherapy and a serum bilirubin in 4 to 24 hours has to be done for a high intermediate the child has to be evaluated for phototherapy and the serum bilirubin values will be done in 24 hours for a low intermediate if the child has been discharged less than 72 hours then a discharge uh, post discharge follow up has to be done in 2 days and in low risk if the discharge is less than 72 hours then 2 to 3 days the parents have to be advised to bring the baby for follow up and there is a type 3 here if the baby's gestational age is more than 38 weeks and there are no hyperbilirubin risk factors again we have to do the pre discharge transcutaneous or a total serum bilirubin it has to be plotted on the bhutani charts again the four groups that is high high intermediate low intermediate and low groups have to be classified for a high group again we need to evaluate for phototherapy and a trans serum 
and the uh, total serum bilirubin has to be repeated in 4 to 24 hours. For a high intermediate, we need to follow up in 2 days. And on follow up, total serum bilirubin or a transcutaneous reading has to be taken. For a low intermediate group, follow up can be done in 2 to 3 days if the discharge has been done before 72 hours. And a low risk group, if the discharge is less than 72 hours, then the child can be followed up as per age of discharge or as and when the need arises. Now how do we evaluate a child who is brought to us with jaundice? First and foremost thing, the gestational age of the child has to be assessed. Along with this, the postnatal age as well. As we have seen the Bhutani chart, there is a separate marking for a preterm baby that less than 35 weeks and 35 to 30, uh, less than 35 weeks is not plotted on the chart. We have 35 to 38 weeks or more than 38 weeks. So accordingly the gestational age has to be determined. The age of onset of jaundice and the total duration for how much the jaundice has been uh, present is again assessed. We need to rule out any history of lethargy, irritability, convulsion, posturing, shrill cry in the child. These can be a sign of chronic terrors or it can be a sign of sepsis secondary to which uh, the jaundice has come up or it can be a sign of any metabolic disorders in the child. So we need to be very careful and assess this. Feeding history has to be uh, determined when. Any antenatal history of antepartum hemorrhage, any premature prolonged rupture of membranes, maternal diabetic mellitus because uh, infant of diabetes mothers are again more prone for jaundice. Any thyroid disorder in mother because the child can have a thyroid disorder, especially hypothyroidism, which can be secondary to maternal uh, thyroid di disorders. Any antenatal infections. Then birth history of birth asphyxia or resuscitations, if it were done, is needed. We need to rule out a family history of jaundice, anemia, any splenic tommy, which will again uh, point us in uh, blood disorders or any metabolic disorder in the family. Is there any previous sibling history of jaundice? Any history of neonatal deaths or morbidities in the family? One important thing is we need to determine when was the first uh, stool pass, that is when was the meconium pass. And currently the stool colors, the frequency of stools have to be determined. Then urine color and frequency should also be determined. The stool frequency will give us many clues. First and foremost thing, if we have, we are dealing with certain abdominal pathology, be it Hirschsprung disease, be it intestinal, uh, some kind of uh, obstruction, and the child has constipation, then uh, that is a cause of jaundice. Also, sometimes cystic fibrosis can present with constipation and jaundice and we don't know because all our tests are coming negative so that has to be kept in mind. Coming over to the clinical assessment, the color of the skin has to be checked. It, important part is the color of the skin should be checked in a naked baby in natural light with a non-yellow background and minimum blanching over the bony surfaces. The severity of jaundice is uh, assessed by grammar staging of jaundice. The next slide will show us the grammar staging. The other things that we need to look for clinically in this child are any signs of anemia, any signs of dehydration, organomegaly has to be uh, looked for. A complete neurological examination of the child should be done because we need to rule out chronic terrors. Especially look for cephalematoma, any uh, bulging of anterior fontanel which can give us intracranial bleed or any bruisings, abdominal mass, distension, or fullness at flank also has to be looked look, uh, look for because ascites can be present. Now how to measure the severity of bilirubin? This is done by the clamor staging. So again we need to know the most important thing is the child should be naked, the child should be uh, the clamor staging, the color should be assessed in natural light. There has to be no yellow background. There should be minimal blanching over the bony surfaces. So if we see 
that there is jaundice on the face, it gives us approximately the level of bilirubin is 5 mg per deciliter. If it is still the upper trunk, that is uh, the first as well as the second part, then it is approximately 6 to 8. If uh, the child has icterus till the thighs, then we have an approximate bilirubin of 9 to 12. Now, if the arms and the lower legs, except the palms and the soles, then we have bilirubin level of 13 to 15. And once the palms and the uh, soles are involved, we have bilirubin approximately more than 15. So, these values are approximate values and uh, can give us a clue and the further checking of the child. But the thing to remember is that the camera staging will not work for a baby who has been under phototherapy. Because once the child is under phototherapy, there will be some amount of blanching which is occurring and then the clamor staging becomes uh, very uh, difficult as well as very inaccurate. Again, in a dark colored child, this will be difficult to do. So, coming over to the laboratory uh, part. Now, bilirubin measurement can be done by transcutaneous bilirubinometer, which is a very easy technique, a very non-invasive technique and can be done by total serum bilirubin concentration. Now, for transcutaneous bilirubinometer, it is useful adjunct to total serum bilirubin measurement and it can be routinely employed so that we can reduce the need for blood sampling. Now, the TCB can be used in infants of 35 weeks or more gestation and after 24 hours of life. So, this is one important uh, drawback because if the child has jaundice in the first 24 hours, we need to go for blood sampling and determine the total serum bilirubin levels only. The TCB has a good correlation with the total serum bilirubin levels, but it becomes unreliable once the TSB levels goes beyond 14. Trends can be checked by TCB values 12 hours apart. These are better than a, at a predicting predictive value than a single reading. Then a total uh, transcutaneous bilirubin value more than 12 to 14 needs to be again confirmed by the TSB examination. So, in which patients should we go for TSB measurement? That is the total serum bilirubin blood measurements. Any child coming with jaundice in the first 24 hours, beyond 24 hours, if we visually assess jaundice, is likely to be more than 12 to 14. That is, if we have the child who is presenting with ectoris till the soles, then we need to go for a total serum bilirubin level. If we are unsure about the visual assessment, as we have said, if the child has been under a phototherapy or if the child is dark skin, it's always better to go for total serum bilirubin levels. And during phototherapy, for monitoring progress and after phototherapy to check for the rebound, go for total serum bilirubin measurements. Now, let us go over the approach and the treatment of unconjugated neonatal hyperbilirubinemia. We need to perform a visual assessment every 12 hourly for the initial 3 to 5 days. This can be supplemented by a cutaneous bilirubin level measurements. So, we did to determine does the baby have serious jaundice? Yes or no? If no, then does the infant have significant jaundice to require total serum bilirubin measurement? Yes or no? If no, then continue the observation every 12 to 24 hours for the next few days. If the child seems to have icterus, which is uh, by grammar staging we find that the icterus goes till the soles, then yes, get the total serum bilirubin measurements done. Now, moving back a little, when we are seeing whether the baby has serious jaundice, if we feel yes, immediately start phototherapy. Measure the total serum bilirubin levels to determine whether the infant needs phototherapy or exchange transfusion. Once the management is done, we need to determine what is the cause of jaundice and accordingly the further management and follow-up care will be determined. 
so these are again the bhutani charts the point to be noted is the bhutani chart works only for babies beyond 35 weeks of gestation so for a preterm baby we have to go clinically and where you have the slightest doubt go for a total serum bilirubin levels and uh, start the phototherapy for the child if the child appears to be icteric while plotting the bilirubin levels on the putani chart always use total bilirubin never subtract the direct or the conjugated bilirubin reading so the dashed lines for the first 24 hours indicate uncertainty because there is a wide range of clinical circumstances again immediate exchange transfusion is recommended if the infant shows signs of acute bilirubin encephalopathy that is the signs of chronic terus in form of hypotonia or retrocolis opisthotonus even shrill cry measure serum albumin and calculate the bilirubin to albumin ratio if we are unsure of that and uh, if the infant is well 35 to less than 38 weeks we can individualize the total serum bilirubin levels for exchange based on the actual gestational age now for less than 35 weeks gestation currently we don't have any consensus guidelines available for employing phototherapy or exchange transfusion in these babies the proposed total serum bilirubin cutoffs are arbitrary and clinical judgment is needed whether uh, for the decision whether the child needs phototherapy or exchange transfusion this is a general uh, this cannot be called a guideline this is a general cutoff which has been given the post menstrual age will be calculated if it is less than 28 then uh, even uh, 11 mg per deciliter can be uh, called exchange range this gives us a rough guideline and we have the range it is always better to have a chart on your walls in the nicu so that any baby we need to calculate the post menstrual age and immediately look for the values and that will give us a clue whether we need to start the child on phototherapy or whether the child seems to be approaching the exchange level or has crossed the exchange level and may require exchange transfusion now how to diagnose the causes of jaundice in the child we need to follow a definite uh, path so the child is brought to you the newborn has clinical jaundice first and foremost thing is measure the bilirubin levels if the bilirubin levels are roughly less than 12 mg deciliter of the or the child is more than 24 hours the approach goes separately or for a child who is less than 24 hours and the bilirubin goes more than 12 we have a separate approach now if we have the first category where the infant is more than 24 hours or the bilirubin levels are less than 12 then we follow up the bilirubin we'll be keeping a close watch on this child in the other case we need to go for the coombs test always remember that any child presenting with uh, jaundice in the first 24 hours of life we need to rule out the life threatening causes we need to look for the coombs test we need to see if there is any hemolysis if there is a hemolysis whether it is rh isoimmunization is it uh, because of any membrane defects in rbcs that has to be checked now coombs test will give us positive or a negative coombs test if it is a positive coombs test we need to identify which antibody is causing this hemolysis whether it is rh whether it is abo whether it is the atypical an- uh, antibodies like kels if our coombs test turns out to be negative for a negative coombs test we'll be checking the direct bilirubin levels as well in practical uh, approach what we do is when we measure the total serum bilirubin levels at that time directly we get the values of direct as well as indirect that makes us uh, our approach even more targeted for a direct bilirubin 
we need to check whether the child is having direct hyperbilirubinemia or indirect. By definition, direct hyperbilirubinemia is when the direct bilirubin is more than 20% of the total serum bilirubin levels. If it is less than 20%, we are dealing with indirect hyperbilirubinemia. If it is a direct bilirubin, we need to consider the causes, that is the differential diagnosis for direct hyperbilirubin. These are neonatal hepatitis, any antenatal infections, that is intrauterine infections, bilirubin obstruction, sepsis in the child, most of the metabolic disorders like galactosemia, alpha and antitrypsin deficiency, cystic fibrosis, they are present with direct jaundice. Now, going over to what if my baby has indirect hyperbilirubinemia. The next I need to check is the child's hematocrit. Whether the child has a high hematocrit, as in polycythemia, which can be a direct cause of uh, indirect hyperbilirubinemia in a child. Or if the child has a normal or low hematocrit. If we have a normal to low hematocrit, we need to send the peripheral smear. In peripheral smear, we will be looking for RBC morphology. Along with this, you need to send the retic count. You need to check for the corrected retic count. You need to check for G6PD levels, especially if the child is a male. Now, we have sent our uh, peripheral smear of blood, the retic count and J6PD. Are they normal or are they abnormal? If they are abnormal, that means we are dealing with some blood dyscrasias. It can be in form of membrane defects like spherocytosis, elliptocytosis, pycnocytosis. It can be ABO incompatibility, red cell enzyme deficiencies can be present. Or we may be dealing with hemoglobinopathies or even DIC. DIC can be seen secondary to uh, many of the antenatal infections as well. If however they are normal, then we need to look for the other differential diagnosis. Is there any enclosed hemorrhage anywhere in the body? Uh, one important point that I would like to suggest is when you are talking about enclosed hemorrhages, don't just concentrate on the uh, intracranial hemorrhage because what we do generally is we go for a ultrasonography of the skull through the anterior fontanel we look for if there is any hemorrhage if there is no hemorrhage then we look for uh, the child as whole if there is any bruising or any hemorrhage which can be touched if it is not present then we generally discard this finding now uh, we have personally had cases where even adrenal hemorrhage has presented in the form of uh, indirect hyperbilirubinemia. So that is one of the differentials that you need to keep in mind if you don't have any other option coming up. So an ultrasonography of the abdomen can point you towards adrenal hemorrhage. An adrenal hemorrhage is not a very uncommon finding. It can be seen secondary to your sepsis also. So that is one more thing that you need to have in your mind. Next, uh, the jaundice can be secondary to increased enterohepatic circulation. Hypothyroidism has to has to be ruled out because jaundice is not something that I am very concerned about. But if jaundice was the only presenting feature of hypothyroidism and we have somehow missed that in a child, then that is a very huge uh, failure on our side because we could have... Uh, treated the hypothyroidism in the early stage and the child would have ment been mentally completely normal but we missed it and the child somehow lands up into a, a retarded neurologic growth. So that is not supposed to be done. You need to rule out hypothyroidism. Again, infant of diabetic mother, it is very common to have indirect jaundice. Then uh, the syndromes like regular nachar syndromes. IEMs will generally present with uh, signs more than just jaundice. And breast milk jaundice, of course, we have it, but it is always a diagnosis of exclusion. So we need to rule out all the other causes before uh, terming a child with jaundice as a breast milk jaundice. So this was the diagnosis part. Now what do we do for these children? What are the therapeutic options which are available? Now phototherapy is uh, given for mild jaundice, but rather than saying mild jaundice, as we clearly have charts, we can plot and uh, decide 
which of the babies need phototherapy and which of those which are severe enough need exchange transfusion gold standard of treatment of neonatal indirect hypobilirubinemia is phototherapy Phototherapy acts by photooxidation, photoisomerization, and structural isomerization. That is conversion of insoluble bilirubin into soluble isomers, which are easily excreted in urine and feces. The phototherapy units, which are available in market, have a variety of light sources, and these include fluorescent lamps, halogen bulbs, high-intensity LED lamps, and fiber optic light sources. With easy availability and low cost, now CFLs are uh, most commonly used. But in the last few years, LED use has also increased tremendously. There are certain equipment specifications which are needed for phototherapy unit. The unit should have a wavelength between 460 to 490 nm. So practically what we use is white lights and blue lights. Uh, we need an irradiance of minimum of 30 uh, microwatts per centimeter square per nm. The child should be placed approximately 30 to 45 centimeter away from the unit or as per the manufacturer instructions if uh, some specifications have been mentioned. A child placed under phototherapy will uh, have to be kept naked except for the diaper and the iPad. So the ambient room temperature has to be maintained approximately 26 to 28 degrees because we don't want the child to land up into hypothermia. A plastic cover or shield has to be placed before the phototherapy lamps to avoid accidental injury in case the lamp breaks. Now this was a case which was needed for initial uh, phototherapy units. But the ones which are commercially available currently, they don't need extra shield. They are already made with that shield. Now coming over to what are the patient specifications, we need to expose the maximal surface area of the baby. So all the clothes of the baby have to be removed except for the diaper and the eye pad which we apply, a small eye patch. Make sure that this eye patch is not covering the baby's nostrils. Now uh, one major doubt which most of us don't ask is what exactly is happening to the eyes of the child. We know that the genitals, the, the radiation which we are giving, it is harmful to the genitals, especially the male genitals that we are talking about. But as per universal guidelines, we uh, put diaper to the baby. Also, it helps in prevention of spoiling, uh, soiling of the uh, sheet materials. But iPad, the studies have been found and there is evidence which suggests that the phototherapy unit does not have any effect on the eyes of the baby. They don't have any effect on the retina of the child as well. However, we apply eye patch just so that the irritability of the child, because of that light continuously hitting your eyes, is uh, avoided. Practically, it means that if you sit near a phototherapy unit and look at the light, or if there is a light which is shining on your uh, eyes for this 12 hours or say 24 hours, it brings a huge irritability. There is headache which even we have. So we don't want our uh, babies to land up with the same and we want them to have a proper uh, sleep cycle in between the child should feed well and everything. For that reason the eye patch is used and not because it damages the retina or anything. Then avoid blocking the lights by any equipment like the warmer parts, large diaper, cap, dressing. By a rule, the diaper should be as small as possible. It should just cover the genitals. If the child is an incubator, then the light should be perpendicular to the baby. Ensure adequate nutrition and hydration of the child. Minimize any interruption during feeds or procedure. So when the mother is feeding the baby, we need to counsel the mother prior that she has to feed the baby, she has to burp the baby and put the baby back inside the phototherapy unit because we need to expose the baby for as much as possible time wise and uh, surface area wise to bring down the jaundice level. There is no need to supplement breastfeed with any other feeds or fluids during phototherapy unless your child is very dehydrated which should not occur. So the hydration part has to be uh, dealt with by oral feeds itself. Monitor the temperature of the baby 2 to 4 hourly. Total serum bilirubin levels have to be in 12 to 24 hourly and watch for rebound bilirubin clinically. 
Now rebound bilirubin is the terminology which means that once the child has been placed under the phototherapy and uh, the level of serum bilirubin has come down, after that we shut down the phototherapy units. 12 hours we keep the child without phototherapy and at the end of this 12 hours we need to assess whether the bilirubin levels are again increasing or not. Okay. So if the levels are okay, it is fine. If the levels are increasing, this is rebound hyperbilirubinemia and sometimes again the phototherapy need to be started for this. Monitor the baby's hydration status, especially the urine output. Now what are the side effects for phototherapy? There is increased insensible water loss, dehydration. So the answer to this is frequent breastfeeding should be continued and uh, dehydration has to be prevented. A child under phototherapy will have loose green stools. This has to be counseled to the mother as well and the child has to be weighed often and dehydration should be looked for in the child and breast milk uh, given adequately can compensate for this. Then uh, the child under phototherapy can have skin rashes. Now the skin rashes are harmless. There is no need to discontinue phototherapy and the parents can be counseled that once the phototherapy has stopped, after that the rashes will go by themselves. Uh, one important side effect is a bronze baby syndrome. This occurs if the baby has conjugated bilirubin, hyperbilirubinemia and we are yet giving phototherapy. Because by rule, we want to turn the bilirubin levels in the child from insoluble form to soluble forms that is unconjugated to conjugated forms when the child is placed under phototherapy. If it is already a conjugated bilirubin, then there is no need for phototherapy and in fact it can give uh, the typical color and the child is known as bronze baby syndrome. So we need to uh, have our mind cleared about whether the child has indirect or a direct jaundice and hypo or hypothermia can be secondary to the temperature uh, monitoring fault. Coming over to the next uh, therapeutic modality which is exchange transfusion. Now exchange transfusion is reserved for the most severe forms of neonatal hypobilirubinemia. A double volume exchange transfusion, it has to be performed if the total serum bilirubin levels reach to an age specific cutoff for exchange transfusion or if the child shows sign of bilirubin encephalopathy irrespective of the bilirubin levels then the child needs exchange transfusion. The indications for double volume exchange transfusion at birth for infants include at birth if the cord bilirubin is more than 4.5 mg per deciliter, if the cord hemoglobin is less than 11 which suggests there has been some sort of hemolysis, if the rate of uh, postnatal increase in bilirubin is more than 1 mg per deciliter per hour or the rate of bilirubin increase is more than 0.5 mg per deciliter per hour in the event of uh, hemoglobin being 11 to 13 or if the child is already on phototherapy but the phototherapy fails to limit hyperbilirubinemia and the hyperbilirubin levels are going uh, progressively increasing beyond phototherapy then the child needs exchange transfusion. So this is the chart showing the types and the volume of blood which is needed for exchange transfusion. Now the volume of blood by a general rule we perform double volume exchange transfusion in units. So here assuming the total blood volume in a baby is approximately 80 to 90 ml per kg twice of that is exchanged that is approximately a volume of 160 to 180 ml per kg of whole blood is used if exchange transfusion is planned. Now if we are exchanging the blood for RH isoimmunization then we need to give RH negative and the blood group O that is ORH negative for the baby. This blood is cross matched with the baby's and the mother's blood before uh, giving for exchange. If it is uh, exchange in case of ABO incompatibility again we need to give a blood group O and RH compatible. Care to be taken that the baby's blood group should not be used. It should be either O positive or O negative depend on the RH uh, compatibility and it again has to be cross matched with the baby's and the mother's blood type. For any other conditions like G6PD deficiency or uh, the hemolytic conditions, 
द बेबीज ब्लड ग्रुप एंड आर एच टाइप कैन बी यूज फॉर एक्सचेंजिंग अगेन इट हैज़ टू बी क्रॉस मैच विद द मदर एंड द बेबी सैम्पल प्रेफरेबली वी यूज अ सी पी डी दैट इज साइट्रेट फॉस्फेट डेक्सट्रोज प्रिजर्वेटिव ब्लड द ब्लड शुड बी एज फ्रेश एज पॉसिबल आइडियली लेस दैन सेवेंटी टू आवर्स ओल्ड टू इंश्योर दैट द ब्लड पी एच इज स्टिल लेस दैन सेवन फॉर हाइड्रोक्सपिटालिस वी नीड अ फ्रेश ब्लड विद इन ट्वेंटी फोर आवर्स सो यू कैन रिक्वेस्ट द ब्लड बैंक टू गिव यू द सेम एंड होल ब्लड इज नीडेड फॉर एक्सचेंज ट्रांसफ्यूशन एंड सो दैट वी कैन प्रोसीड विद द प्रोसीजर सो वॉट आर द स्पेसिफिकेशन नीडेड वी नीड एन असिस्टेंट हेल्थ the sterile field has to be maintained for monitoring assessing of the infant recording of the procedure and the exchange of volumes assistant has to be sitting there with a pen and a paper he has to record every cycle of blood which is going inside the baby and which is being removed out of the baby along with the time on the clock in which the procedure is being done the equipment needed is a radiant warmer or incubator in which the child is placed pulse oximeter has to be connected resuscitation apparatus has to be kept ready because any time the child suddenly collapses we may need to intubate the child uh, the umbilical arterial or venous catheter depending on which type of exchange we are doing but commonly what we do is umbilical venous catheter insertion then the equipments needed for it bivalves at least two exchange transfusion circuit then blood for exchange has to be warmed at room temperature the blood should be obtained from the baby for lab studies before and after exchange transfusion the lab uh, investigation sent should be total serum bilirubin calcium levels in the child serum electrolytes and a abg which can give us the ph pco2 bicarb serum in the blood again the serum uh, glucose of the baby will be checked hemoglobin specially for uh, your uh, hemoglobin levels as well as your wbc and platelet levels blood culture is recommended after exchange transfusion so initially we'll be just uh, going with our uh, routine lab parameters now the procedure for exchange transfusion here double volume exchange transfusion is done in hyperbilirubinemia normal blood volume in a newborn is approximately 80 to 90 in a full term baby it is approximately 80 ml per kg and for a pre term it can go as high as 90 to 100 so therefore averagely we use 160 ml per kg of blood after the blood grouping cross matching and uh, which uh, blood group we have to decide as per the cause which we have already discussed the procedure has to be performed under complete aseptic precautions the baby is placed in supine position restraints can be given they can be snug but not very tight stomach has to be decompressed by a nasogastric tube and the tube has to be left in c2 with the end open then this is a complete surgical procedure so we need to have surgical scrub surgical sterile gown gloves have to be used perform umbilical venous catheterization and confirm the position of the same by a radiograph If isometric volumetric double exchange has to be done, then and then only umbilical uh, artery catheter has to be inserted. Currently, there are very few indications for doing exchange via umbilical artery catheter. Uh, these include the isovolumetric double exchange. That is, if we have a child who has, uh, say, hydrophytalis, where even if we push a little amount of blood, still uh, it can cause overload. so in these cases we'll be doing the isovolumetric double exchange where we push the blood through the artery and remove uh, where we push the blood through the umbilical uh, venous catheter and remove the blood through the umbilical arterial catheter however in general uh, uh, scenarios we use a push and pull technique through the umbilical venous catheter uh, catheter insertion itself So have the unit of blood ready attach the bag of blood to the tubing and the stop cocks according to the direction of the transfusion tray then check the orientation of the stop cock directions before starting the infusion and withdraw establish the volume of each alicot which is going to be used according to infant weight the alicots uh, this is a general guidelines which have been given if the child is less than 850 g approximately 1 to 3 ml of blood can be pushed and pulled Uh, that is each alicots 
if the child is say 1 to 2 kg 10 ml alicot can be used for a child with uh, less than 1 kg 5 ml accordingly according to the weight the alicot will be determined exchange transfusion can be done by the push and pull technique through the umbilical uh, vein the recommended duration of the entire exchange procedure is 1 hour after exchange transfusion phototherapy is continued uh, we generally go for uh, intensive phototherapy and bilirubin levels are measured every 4 hours serum calcium gluconate antibiotics are to be given on individual basis there is a very uh, it is a very controversial topic whether you need to routinely give calcium gluconate or not but what uh, is better to be followed what we generally follow is that you is that you check the serum calcium uh, levels of the child after the exchange has been done if the levels come very low then only uh, go for a calcium gluconate infusion the side effects that we need to be uh, warned about for exchange post exchange transfusion are hypoglycemia hypocalcemia hyperkalemia can result especially if the blood is old then hyperkalemia is very common then bleeding or coagulopathies can uh, be seen in the child there can be infections again the infection can be curbed down to a large extent depending on how well you have done the procedure and sometimes a child can have late metabolic alkalosis uh, as per the lab parameters thrombocytopenia is one thing which is very commonly seen post exchange but we need to keep our radar high on whether this thrombocytopenia is just secondary to the exchange transfusion or whether there is the sepsis component which has come up there are certain other treatment modalities for indirect jaundice as well first is phenobarbital now phenobarbital increases the hepatic gluconeal transferase activity and uh, conjugation of bilirubin it is used to treat krigler najar syndromes or gilbert syndromes it is not effective as an urgent treatment as it takes some time for the effect and uh, there are certain neurologic side effects and especially sedation which limits its use there are certain metal metalloporphyrins which are uh, being used there are trials going on these are uh, tin and zinc uh, porphyrins they work by decreasing the production of bilirubin by competitive inhibition of heme oxygenase so our bilirubin production itself is decreased and so there will not be any hyperbilirubin in it but their long term safety is still under study and they are not yet approved by fda we may see uh, them being used in very near future next ibig intravenous immunoglobulin this has been very effective in infants with rh and abo hemolytic disease it has reduced the need for exchange transfusion to a very great extent Uh, currently AAP has recommended this in isoimmune hemolytic disease if the serum bilirubin levels are rising despite phototherapy or the serum bilirubins are within 2 to 3 mg deciliter of exchange levels then along with giving intensive phototherapy one dose of IVIG can be given the dose is 500 mg to 1 g per kg over 2 hours this can be repeated in 12 hours only if it is necessary generally one dose of ivig can uh, give you the large benefit of prevention of uh, exchange transfusion albumin again this is a controversial topic albumin has to be given if the albumin levels are low and if you find that that is the cause of hyperbilirubinemia then yes albumin can be given now before uh, we end up the topic we conclude the topic the why are we so concerned about uh, hyperbilirubinemia like we said virtually it is present in all the newborns so why are we so adamant on uh, treating it because we don't want any child to land up in the most potent complication of hyperbilirubinemia which is pernicterus this is a consequence of indirect hyperbilirubinemia again now chronic tetanus is caused secondary to chronic bilirubin encephalopathy acute bilirubin encephalopathy may develop during hazardous hyperbilirubinemia and develop in chronic adverse neurodevelopmental sequelae there is a tetrad of chronic tetanus first is chorioarthritoid cerebral palsy 
then high frequency central neural hearing loss vertical gaze palsy and dental enamel hypoplasia this is this is the tetrad of chronic teres which we are very concerned about because the child can land up in these if not treated at the immediate this is cause secondary to unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia bilirubin has a predilection to neurons and the involvement of basal ganglia cochlea and oculomotor neurons specially there are three stages of chronic teres in stage 1 the child will have decreased activity uh, there will be poor sucking hypotonia and the cry will be high pitched in uh, stage 2 there are all the features of stage 1 along with it there is rigid extension of all the four extremities a tight fisted posturing of arms crossed extension of legs high pitched irritable cry sometimes the child may have retropolis opisthotonus posture seizure now this is the stage these are the stages where immediate exchange is warranted any smallest chance of chronic teres demands an immediate exchange transfusion and no other treatment modality in stage 3 there will be hypotonia retrocolis opisthotonus stupor and coma now uh, the mri findings of a brain with chronic teres there are abnormally high signal intensities on the t1 weighted images at the basal ganglia thalamus and internal capsule as we have seen these are the areas which are uh, the bilirubin is more uh, predilected to move towards similar but less intense signal were seen on t2 weighted images so if we are doing mri for chronic teres we need to look at the t1 weighted images so conclusion hmm? so these are certain aap guidelines which are given the key elements of the recommendations provided by this client guidelines that is this is the summary the take home message out of our entire presentation firstly promoting and supporting successful breastfeeding establishing nursery protocols for the identification and evaluation of hyperbilirubinemia measurement of the total serum bilirubin or the transcutaneous bilirubin levels on infants who are jaundiced in the first 24 hours is at most essential recognize that visual estimation of the degree of jaundice can lead to errors particularly in dark and pigmented infants interpretation of all the bilirubin levels have to be done according to the infant's age in hours recognize that the infants at less than 38 weeks gestation particularly those who are breastfed are at higher risk of developing hyperbilirubinemia and may require closer surveillance and monitoring perform a systematic assessment on all the infants before discharge for the risk of severe hyperbilirubinemia provide the parents with a written and a verbal information about the newborn jaundice now this is very important because the parents need to know why exactly are we calling the baby for a follow and that doesn't have to be missed provide appropriate follow up based on the time of discharge and the risk assessments and treat the newborns when indicated with phototherapy or exchange transfusion so thank you so much for watching this video if you have any queries do put the queries or any suggestions in the comment box below and uh, subscribe like watch neonato hub and there will be many more such topics coming on our next in line will be direct jaundice Uh, which will be available soon enough thank you so much